Before I open the meeting, I'd like to remind you that the public section of this meeting is being recorded and will be made available on the Bay of Plenty Regional Council website following the meeting and archive for a period of three years. For those members of the public here today, um, all care would be taken to preserve your privacy. However, as a visitor in the public gallery, your presence may be recorded. Um, by remaining in the public gallery, it is understood your consent is given if your image is inadvertently broadcast. I also remind all all present that the local government decision making affords no protection to councillors, council officers, and the public of comments made during the meeting that are subsequently challenged in court of law and determined to be slanderous. So, um, having uh, given that notice, I'm going to open the meeting and I'm going to welcome um, and ask Councillor Eti to give our opening character. Chamatata <laughs> I have an apology from uh, Chairman Leader who has other council business to attend to today. Um, are there any further apologies from the floor? Moved. Second. Second. Moved. Councillor Winters, second. Councillor Rose, thank you. Um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Uh, no. Against? Carried. Um, there's no public forum and there are no items to be discussed that are not on the agenda. Um, we have with regard to order of business, we have a few changes. So I just want to note that item 10.5, which is community participation and impact, will be discussed before the agenda item 10.4, which is enhancing youth engagement. And I'll prompt you um, of that change when we get there. And we have two fixed time items. The Keyside Draft Statement of Intent and Confidential Presentation will be at 11 a.m and the LGFA draft statement of intent will be um, considered at 12, and so they will impact on um, the order of business. Have I got any declarations of conflict of interest? Yes, Madam Chair, Keyside SOI and presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor White. Um, we have no public excluded business to be transferred to the open. And so we'll now turn our attention to the minutes. So the first minutes are the Regional Council minutes of 16th of February. Um, are there any matters arising uh, to those minutes? Thank you, Councillor Rose. Do I have a second? Councillor Brunning, thank you. I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. Against? That motion is carried. Uh, the Extraordinary Regional Council minutes of 10th of March 2021. Are there any matters arising? Okay, so we will have, we'll take Councillor Winters as mover and Councillor Rose as seconder. Put that motion, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against, carried. Now, uh, the Regional Transport Committee meeting minutes of the 3rd of December, um, are there any matters arising? I moved, Madam Chair, they're very historic as we can see, but what's changed since then? So, no, they have to move. And I'm happy to second as uh, the chair of that committee, so I'll put that motion on those in favour. Against, carried. Um, and the Smart Growth Leadership Group minutes of the 21st of October um, and the 16th of December 2020, if you don't mind, we'll take them together. Are there any matters arising? If not, do I have a mover for those minutes? Thank you, uh, Councillor Crosby. There's no second from the chair, I will second as I attended them both. Um, I put those motions, all those in favour? Aye. Against, carried. And lastly, the Civil Defence Emergency Management Group Joint Committee Minutes, 18th of December 2020. Are there any matters arising? No. Nope. Move. Moved by Councillor Love, seconded. Pro forma, by myself. I put that motion, all those in favour? Aye. Against, carried. 
So now we move to a very um, interesting, exciting part of the agenda, which is our presentations. And we have Ben Neve here, um, who is a staff member who used to be a summer student and who's now a permanent staff member. So Ben, welcome. Um, we look forward to um, getting your presentation on your summer experience. Good morning, councillors. And so, as um, Councillor Lee's just said, we've got Ben here this morning. And we're a little bit delayed um, this year due to some changes in COVID restrictions. So, um, we're a little bit later in the year than normal, but we know that you really enjoy um, hearing from the students. So, we've kept it on the agenda. We're very lucky that Ben has actually stayed with us and now has accepted a role as a graduate advisor within Emergency Management Bay of Plenty. Um, and so with Ben still being here, he's uh, very kindly agreed to do the presentation that the students were going to go do for you a little while ago. I'll hand over to Ben. Awesome. Sorry. Awesome. Morena Koto Katoa. Uh, my name is Ben Neve, as you know, and I'm here presenting on behalf of the students that were involved in the 2020-2021 uh, 21 Summer Experience Program. Uh, firstly, I would just like to thank you for the opportunity to present some of the highlights of the program to you guys today. Um, I'd like to share with you a short video from all of us um, at the, in the Summer Mahi um, program. Um, this was developed by Bop RC Comms and it highlighted what the program meant to us all. So, I'm going to have to get started. Sound could be a little funny, but Learning, growing, and working hard. The OPRC means to me to play the kaitiaki of our region dedicated to protecting the environment. Toi Moana means to be the opportunity to grow and explore. To me, Toi Moana means people working together towards a shared vision for our community and environment. To me, being a part of the OPRC means being a part of a team that helps monitor and improve the environment. I'm grateful I get to learn from such experienced people. One thing I'm grateful this summer is the endless opportunities we're given. I'm most grateful for um, working with incredible, friendly and helpful people at the Māori policy team, the council and the Whātiawa. The thing I'm most grateful for is learning valuable knowledge and experience of the people around me as well as creating great connections. I'm most grateful for the opportunity to be involved with the biosecurity team and get out in the field working with um, community groups and landowners. Uh, if I could describe the summer experience in one word, I'd say awesome. Uh, to sum up the summer experience in one word, it would be advantageous. One word that I would use to describe this program is transformational. If I could describe the summer experience in one word, I'd use enlightening. Uh, one word I would use to describe the summer experience program would be instantaneous. If I had to sum up my experience at Tuamuana in one word, it would be Whanaungatanga. If I could describe the Summer Experience Program in one word, it would be invaluable. If I could describe the Summer Experience Program in one word, it would be inspiring. My highlight of the Summer Student Experience has been to do a rain gauge calibration on a helicopter trip. My highlight is the atmosphere of passionate people that really push us as students and as an organisation to do the very best that we can do. One of my highlights this summer has been meeting new people that are so passionate about their jobs. My highlight for the summer student experience is learning from my team and making new friends. My highlight of uh, working here is, uh, is really working with a team and, uh, and getting to know all the people and um, everyone that's so friendly. Uh, this program truly offers an invaluable pathway for university students to gain experience in a wide range of career paths within the Bay of Regional Council. It also enables us to test out these different career paths, offering insight as to whether it is something we truly want to pursue. Um, proof of this is the four summer students, including myself, that are now um, employed at BOPRC on a full or part-time basis. This is fantastic to see as it sees it shows that this program is more than just an internship and that it is a genuine desire for these students to develop into full-time roles within the OPRC. And for this opportunity, I can't thank you all enough. Some of the highlights from the summer program were the community day, where we assisted Chris from Coast Care to weed a section of the dunes around her Marnie surf park. Um, another is the Corridor and Kai event. A career development event where we had a number of staff within BOPRC, including our very own Chief, Chief Executive Fiona, were invited to share their career journeys with the students. 
this helped a number of us understand that careers don't always go uh, in a straight line and it is okay to have setbacks along the way. Another highlight for me personally was the intra-office table tennis championship. All the students competed in a round robin competition and um, the best players were pitted against each other at the end of it. Um, so this summer, as you know, I was a summer student within the MBOP. I was within the operations team and I assisted with anything from the COVID-19 resurgence planning um, and actually helped respond during the 5th of March Kermadec tsunami response. Um, this, this experience was incredible as it really put into perspective my studies and highlighted the essential relationships we must maintain with our local territorial authorities and the trust we must put not in just each other but staff within BOPRC to help us respond to these events. Um, I'll just keep it nice and short. So once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, just speaking for myself, before I pass over to Councillor Lutt, who's got a question, I just want to say that these presentations um, uh, give us a real insight into our organisation and our culture and the work that we do. And so thank you very much for coming and showing us that today. That's for love. Uh, thank you. Ben, as chairman of the CDMG, uh, I became very much aware of your contribution to the uh, to the work of MBOP, uh, and that's Emergency Management BFP for those who don't like acronyms. Uh, you really did make a, a major contribution I'm delighted to see that you've been employed back, and I think it shows the value and the strength of the programme. So well done, and I'm delighted to see you working here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I must admit, CEDM is, um, we do have a lot of acronyms, and uh, it's, been, it's been one of the biggest learning curves trying to keep up with all of them, but um, yeah, I appreciate that, Council. I've um, really enjoyed getting in, into the team, and um, as I said, putting my studies into perspective, because often at uni you learn blue sky thinking, but it's not actually how it is in real life. So um, putting that um, study to practice has been a really unique opportunity, and again, thank you for that. Cheers. That's your advice. Yeah, um, so look, um, the four, the four uh, members of that group who are now hired um, by regional council and MBOP are just proof of what um, the next generation can do. Um, and so, Ben, I just want to say well done. Um, I know that um, over the course of the summer you've, you have learned a lot of things and, um, yeah, it's, it's really good to see yourself and others really um, continuing forward in this organisation, so well done. Um, and we look forward to what else you have to offer um, in your new role. Congratulations on, on the mahi you're doing. I think it's very much part of a, a very sound strategic um, succession planning. Um, just a question for you. Um, are there any recommendations that you would make um, regarding your experience on the program? Uh, I think overall, everyone within um, the organisation was absolutely amazing in terms of facilitating our development. Um, one thing I'd like to say, that most students I know had a great experience in terms of um, actually getting pushed forward and developing and learning new skills as opposed to just being put in into a sort of an admin style intern role. Um, but I believe there was a couple of that, so maybe just pushing that, more of that. Um, from MBOP point of view, um, the team were fantastic with me. I was put in across the board and help out um, wherever I was needed. Um, and I'd like to think that my contributions were noted, so no, I think it was great. Thanks. Um, Councillor Thompson. Uh, yeah, look, I'd just actually like to record um, my respect and appreciation to you, Karen. Um, I think you have brought to this organisation a very strategic HR understanding and implementation, uh, and I think this is just one example. Uh, of how this organisation has been really well served, obviously under the leadership of Fiona, but you in particular and your team. So I really just do want to appreciate and show that uh, respect to you. So thank you. Thank you. I will, um, once again, thanks for your presentation, Ben. I'm sure we'll look forward to seeing more of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Councillor, the next item is the Chairman's Report, which is on page 57. Um, in Chairman Leader's absence, um, 
uh, our chief executive will um, attempt to give any answers to any queries that you have for meetings that she wasn't at. If, if um, she isn't able to answer, then I request that you um, contact human leader directly. So, um, Councillor Winters. I oh, just want to note it on the record, Madam Chair, 11th of March, the um, Bapalini Regional Council LTP presentation to Rotary Lakes Council. Uh, there was a, quite a team of us there, and I just want to record thanks to myself, Chairman, other councillors who came and presented that day on behalf of Te Taru and Lyle. I think it went really well. Um, the level of questioning and engagement by RDC was superb. And we had some curly questions, and I think everybody contributed on the day. So I was really proud to present um, on, you know, to to RDC on our long-term vision LTP. So I just want to note it on record, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. There are no further questions. I will move that the chairman's report be received, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much. I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Um, so now we move on to the um, item 10.2, approval of the proposed change five, uh, Kartuna River to the Bay of Kiki Regional Policy Statement. And we have uh, Namuta um, and instead of NASA, NASA's not. Uh, uh, your chair, NASA is coming. He should be here shortly, but I'm happy to um, take the report as read. Um, this is a key uh, next step in terms of implementing the Tapuika Claims Settlement Act, which is making that change to our regional policy statement. Uh, so we have been on a journey for this one, uh, and you'll recall we've had um, several discussions in relation uh, to this, both uh, with um, Te Marua Kaituna in terms of helping develop this change uh, to bring us to this point today. So it's page 62 of your agendas. Councillor Thompson. Yes, Madam Chair, um, it um, gives me great pleasure to be able to move these recommendations. Indeed, this has been on a journey, uh, and I compliment the staff uh, for the way in which that they have engaged uh, in terms of making sure that this is an appropriate and fit for purpose um, RPS change. So it gives me great pleasure. I want to thank you, uh, Namuta, and particularly Nessa. Uh, for all the hard work that's gone into this. But hopefully, today, this particular journey might end. Thank you. Seconded. Oh, thank you, Councillor White. Um, is there any discussion of the item? If not, I just want to acknowledge the, um, the number of times that this item has actually come back through Council, through the various committees. I think it's had a very rigorous um, consideration. Um, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to move the motion that we actually adopt this notification. So, um, I did. oh, sorry, to, to put the motion. How's that? So I put the motion, all that in favour? Aye. Aye. Against, carried. Okay. So now we are moving to the Comity Māori Partnership, Māori Partnership League paper on page 108. So, Namuti, you're still there, and we have Stephen Lamb and Katarina O'Brien rushing up the back to join us. Take it away, team. Tēnā koutou again. Um, another key pivotal paper for your consideration. We do have a few slides here, which we would like to talk to you, uh, talk you through. The first just uh, reminds us about the why. Why are we here, what we are trying to achieve? Uh, so you will all have a copy of this in front of you. Uh, this is our plan on a page in terms of our Māori relationships. You'll see that everything is underpinned by our desire to meet the uh, principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. It also sets the context of our operating environment, which is very complex. We have a lot occurring in the central <coughs> government space in terms of um, key direction, and you'll see there at the top left of your screen. Uh, and You'll recall we have such a complex cultural landscape here with over 36 iwi, 240 kapu, thousands of trusts. Um, so we obviously are very fortunate uh, uh, to be a council who have had a Māori um, constituents uh, and councillors in place for over 16 years. So this is a key next step in our journey in terms of our uh, reflections on committee Māori and how we might uh, look to move um, uh, together into the future. A key component to this uh, of course, uh, and our, one of our key strategic priorities is partnering with Māori, 
And one way in which we can uh, uh, we think we can make the biggest impact is in the enhanced shared decision making space. So I'll pass over to Stephen to quickly touch on a few points. Uh, so one of the strategic priorities for Council is working effectively with Māori partnerships uh, to deliver outcomes for the region. We do shorten that down to partnerships with Māori. Um, the question that we should follow fairly swiftly is what does partnership mean? Uh, now this is an internal working definition, um, it's explained a bit more in the paper, uh, and it's been ad adapted from Te Arapiti, the, the X of the Treaty Settlements, uh, their, their approach to partnership. Uh, of those four points, um, sharing decision making becomes in our mind the most critical one. Um, the others kind of follow around it. Um, so this is where you'll see the language of shared decision making coming through the fore. So just very quickly in terms of the recommendations from the council uh, to, the, to the council, um, the first one around the terms of reference is that the preferred option uh, based on our analysis and a number of discussions is to make the committee the whole. Um, one of the key reasons there is to expose all councillors to the co-op Māori. The focus is on shared decision making, and that is for the committee then to set its own work program, set its own priorities, and to take that forward. And there are a few other minor, we'll call them almost editorial changes. That's one thing that did come up in the discussion yesterday uh, around the, the making the, the, the change focus on shared decision making more specific was the addition of some words around how we specific, make that specific to Māori. Uh, and if the council is of a mind to do that, Staff would be in support. This would be fairly simply added um, towards the, the back of the actual the role is first and foremost to provide leadership to council on enhancing the co up of shared decision making uh, with Māori across all aspects of council's work. Thank you. Is that the end of the staff presentation? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If so, I'd like to pass it over to our um, um, Māori ward councillors to, to make comment further on this. Um, I think it's um, better that um, you get the best opportunity to make comment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank staff um, and Fiona for um, uh, presenting and putting terms of reference together. I think it's a clear indication of the discussions that have been held uh, between ourselves leading up to this and taking into consideration to uh, the report from um, PwC. Your mic has Not too much. It's coming to you in spirit. Uh, so yes, I, I do want to congratulate staff um, uh, for the work that's been put in. And um, I guess today is a, um, I'm not a, I don't want to say historic, but it's certainly a turning point, I think, for this council uh, for how we are intending to work with Māori. I think it's, um, it's foresightful uh, and where we need to be um, heading uh, in our um, working alongside hapu, iwi um, and other uh, Māori authorities. So I think it's certainly an incremental step in the right direction. Um, I just want to say um, this is still part of the journey. We haven't reached the end of the journey yet, but I think it's a an excellent starting point for where we intend to head given what's coming um, to us from central government, and certainly um, in achieving some of the aspirations that have been provided to us over the years from respect of hapu iwi throughout our whole region. So again, I want to take staff that have been um, responsible in analysing all that feedback that we've had from hapu iwi throughout the, um, throughout the region. I know some, express, uh, some concern has been expressed as to whether we have taken uh, what we're doing uh, out to the communities, but I'm quite confident that we have had enough discussions uh, with Māori throughout the whole region to really uh, start looking at materialising some of that feedback that has been obtained over the years working alongside Māori. So I actually see this as a positive step um, 
forward. Um, and just to reiterate, though, this is a journey and we're still not quite there. So thank you. Kia ora I would certainly like to echo the sentiments of uh, Councillor McDonald regarding the, uh, uh, the thanks to staff. Uh, this has been a journey. And um, I, I think this is, no, this is certainly the, the next step in that journey. I think quite a step change too. Um, I do take on uh, some of the comments uh, uh, regarding this is dependent upon a really strong work program. This is just the first step. We have to have the work program to, to come in behind this, um, but also that this is just the beginning and ultimately we have to move quickly to form those relationships, uh, however they look, with iwi and with hapu, um, and that they are at the table, whatever those tables are. Um, but I am also really glad that we are doing this journey together and that it is not just upon the Māori caucus to to carry the burden and that we, um, all councillors, uh, will be there with us as recommended here um, because it is indeed quite a challenge that we have ahead of us, more so than a lot of other regional councils because we have four, over 40 iwi and over 200 hapū and uh, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned the Māori world being fractured and he thought it might, he might have been uh, overstating the matter somewhat, but you are not. It is, it is fractured. Um, and it is a particular kind of space and we have uh, nowhere to go but forward. So uh, again, thank you staff and kia ora tātou. Kia ora, Madam Chair, and um, again, supporting the comments of my my colleagues, uh, Mati Moana and um, and Toyuki, and also to thank the staff and Turner and the staff for opening this opportunity to be analysed, assessed, and uh, and it's credit to you, the staff that you found the space uh, with our support. Um, and also, uh, I just want to say is um, you know I don't have a long history of regional council inside the council. It's my first term, um, and but I I can understand that. The issue of engaging with EWI has never gone away. It's always been a big issue, and you don't have to look at the records around around tensions and challenges that have been there um, to suggest that you know it's, it is time for change. And I want to pay respect to my constituency colleagues um, for the way I guess we have been working and trying to work in this space on a very contentious matter. I want to thank the, the board members whether you agree or not for the opportunity to listen and for us to raise this in this particular forum as colleagues, as people who I see are looking for the best for our communities out there. And of course we are representing, sure we're representing our mighty constituencies, but I think our always our intent is to present the best we can um, to council and to our communities across the region. There's no doubt that the regional council, this regional council is on record, is on record, I guess, is, as being a, uh, an exemplar of engagement relative to other councils around the country. But if you go outside into the community, you might get a different perspective. And that shows by levels of participation from time to time that you get. And um, yeah, I get disappointed when we don't have uh, a, a lot of our people turning up in certain occasions, um, but being out there in a community, I also can understand the pressures they're under, uh, the deprivations they face, and uh, and if we can roll forward as a, as, a, as a big vehicle loading a lot of stuff behind us, but they don't have necessarily the ability to respond. And, and accordingly can quickly lose interest and do things that are closer to home for them. So for us, what we're trying to do as your constituency colleagues is to raise the game, is to bring our people, our members out there into the discussions and to lift them in that space. And that is on the shoulders in many respects, not just all the constituency, my constituency members, but all of council. We need your support. And that's really what it comes down to, we need your support. Um, whatever 
disagreements we may have on, on details around this matter. Uh, your constituency, my constituency members, uh, have that additional perspective inside those communities that we wish to bring to the table as a collective. And so on that basis of that, we are trying to give us the best possible advice supported by our staff. So on that note, Madam Chair, um, I have nothing more to say. Kia ora. Uh, Councillor Thurston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, there's someone heavy on my thoughts today, and that's the late Councillor Maureen Waka. And uh, Maureen was a very close friend of mine. Uh, and Maureen was a long-standing member of the Rotorua Lakes Council, and she was a member of the uh, Environment Bay of Plenty, dare I say, uh, the Māori Regional Representation Committee back in 1996. And I think it was Maureen who single-handedly persuaded her colleagues uh, on that committee um, to push for the engagement uh, of Māori seats at this table. And for that, uh, I have huge respect for Maureen. Um, but having, having said that, uh, I see this as another step forward. Um, it's going to be one of many, and uh, uh, my Māori constituency colleagues can count on my support as we go forward, as long as everyone is on the same page, everyone's locked in, uh, everyone knows the information and the details and the aspirations uh, so that we can engage with Māori and build much better partnerships and relationships. I will be supporting the recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thurston. Uh, Councillor Crosby. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be supporting the recommendation. I'm particularly guided by the uh, words of the Chair, uh, Councillor MacDonald, and supported by Councillor Eating, Councillor White. Um, that this is the next step. Uh, but I particularly hope, let's say, around November 2022, when uh, the new council starts to consider its, um, its committee structure and makeup, that we um, can move forward on this uh, to really execute the shared decision making process. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Yeah, um, I would just like to echo what um, Councillor Crosby said. I was, um, of course, a wee bit disappointed we couldn't do um, the change, the changes that um, we thought we could do now. Um, and I recognise the fact that, um, yes, our council isn't ready for that. Um, and so I um, will fully support what um, our three mighty councils have said and also just want to... Um, congratulate staff and our three Māori councillors for the mahi that you guys have done over the course of the past six months. Um, and actually, the work you guys are going to do over the next year or so, um, you've done a good job, you've represented us well, and um, we as um, fellow councillors, and I hope I can speak for, well, I hope other councillors will agree, um, we're behind you on this. So. Councillor Love. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to speak to the various options on page 114. Um, with all the discussions we've been having recently, it would seem that uh, option B is much the preferred option. It's indeed the preferred option which staff have given us. Um, necessarily, it is a practical issue, and from the discussions which we've been having, it would appear that those the meetings, therefore, will have to move to here, to the council chamber, to facilitate the size of the new committee, as most of the Marais would not be able to cope with the committee of this size. My only concern is that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and in addition to what we might do in a formal sense, I, I was a member of the Marais Committee in the last triennium, and I very much enjoyed... Uh, participation in that. And the real benefit of it for me was going out and meeting Maori in their in their home, in their in their in their in their own surroundings. And and I think there was a huge advantage for Maori as well, because especially in the breaks we had and, and in the meal we had afterwards, they had the opportunity to realise that, that we weren't two hard monsters or and that we were just normal people in the same way as they were. And I think the collaboration, understanding we achieved in that was, I think, quite tremendous. And I say, 
I don't want to lose that facility. So I think it's important that whatever we do in deciding whether what, what option we go to, if we are going to be moving the, commit, the committee to here, uh, to a formal surrounding, in some way we also need to send out either the committee or parts of the committee to have that li liaison around the horizon, which I think did us so much value and, and really enabled us to listen to the concerns and perhaps explain our problems and difficulties in, in the process. Councillor Winters and then Councillor Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of echoing what David said in terms of uh, moving around the Rohe with the meetings. I'm mindful of the uh, Committee Māori. We went to a Rokokori and we heard from Oravalo on the state of the Rokokomitas. And it was a stunning presentation. It's still got um, um, an imprint on me. And we've seen in the last couple of years since that Committee Māori jobs for nature kicking in and there's a bit of a um, head of steam for the Rokokomitas now. I'm also mindful of the Committee Māori going to Ngāpūna and hearing some of the issues of geothermal water quality from my own Te Arawa people. And they leave an impression on you. And so I don't want to lose that by bringing the meeting back to here. So whatever way we can do it to move around the community, great. Um, but let's not lose the ability to go into the rohi of various iwi and hapu to make sure we hear it from them rather than bringing them here because sitting around a table with 14 people is quite overwhelming and we see that in um, Rangitaki River Forum. There's only four of us but um, we try and stay quiet in the Rangitaki River Forum and allow the discussion to happen but I hope we do not overwhelm our audience by having 14 of us turn up plus staff. That's my only concern Madam Chair if we go to a committee of whole, and I'm sure you've got a, 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 a solution, and I welcome that solution, Mati Moana, but let's not, let's not lose that ability to go into our communities and, and meet them on their own turf. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Ora um, Yeah, first, congratulations on our very astute Māori caucus for actually working as a team and getting us to this level. Um, I think it's wonderful. Um, I propose the comments from Council Love and Council Winters. Actually, I see um, with the new widened Committee Māori um, more opportunity to engage with iwi, and particularly marais, because of 37 marais and the rohi, uh, it's absolutely impossible for us to get around it. So we're actually going to have to work out Māori Council is a bit harder, split the rest of the team and take them out and stuff like that so we can get across the rohi presence there. So kia ora for the role you just created for your own back <laughs> Any other comments from the floor? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I just want to, I guess, respond in some way to some of the uh, responses from the councillors, uh, which I want to uh, thank you all for. Um, we, we've certainly taken into consideration the concerns that you've raised. Uh, we appreciate uh, the value of having um, meeting, Māori meetings on Marae and we would never take that away. We see that really as the benefit and how we have managed really to get to the point where we are. It has provided us the opportunity to go out and listen to the people and to record all of those meetings that we've been held, that we held uh, on Manai, I guess, to get to the point where we are here. When we talk about bringing some of those meetings into the council, into the council chamber, it is actually a strategic move that we feel that the time has come where we have to do both on the Marae and around this council table. We have uh, come to realise that there needs to be more strategic direction around what we're gaining from those meetings on the Marae and that we don't turn those meetings uh, on the Marae to merely be talk fests. It is time for us now to sit down and to strategize how we then interpret those presentations that are presented to Māori and how we translate that into whether they need to be policy within this organization and part of our processes. 
this is another part of the journey that needs to be taken. It's taking a strategic focus now on all that information that's coming for us to us via these meetings on the Malai. And you're absolutely right. We need to maintain that because that is really the major platform that we have created for Māori to air their voices at, on their on their own tūrama wai wai. So uh, to those of uh, those of you who have expressed the fact uh, that we shouldn't change that, we won't change that at, at all. Um, the other thing I want to take around logistics, uh, around whether the Māori's can cope with our whole um, with our whole complement of councillors. I, I just want to, I guess, allay your fears that we accommodate vast numbers on the Māori. We have had meetings in Whare that could get up to 200 people inside our body. So it's, it's, it isn't a major logistic. It's just us sitting alongside the Hokanga and organising how that could be done. What it may mean is that we will probably target the bigger Māori, but somehow we have to accommodate those um, smaller Māori. But it's not something that we cannot... Um, uh, we cannot do. It is possible. The other thing that I want to state too is that our meetings around the council table, uh, I'm hoping, will still include the participation of Māori around the table. And to, I guess, just to allay some of the fears that no doubt some of those uh, Māori representatives who are coming to the table, I would say some of them are probably a lot more experience than I am around the table in dealing with boards. So, you know, don't be uh, too alarmed that those that will come in here have had experience around boardroom tables and will won't find um, the surroundings as alien as we think. Uh, so I just want to say to councillors, um, it's, I just want to reiterate, it's the journey that we're taking and we have to take. And just to say, you know, there aren't, uh, while some of the um, initiatives that have been raised in this, this report may appear challenging, there will be solutions, and I'm sure that staff um, have already gone down that track to investigate some of those solutions, and I'm comfortable that we will manage. Thank you. Before I just pass to Councillor Love, I just want to note that um, we have had a, a suggestion, and it was as a result of our discussion yesterday, that there is an, uh, an amendment to the terms of reference to refer to uh, shared decision-making with Māori. Um, so I, I am assuming that the mover will actually uh, be happy to include that in our recommendation too. Um, so I'll pass it over to Councillor Love to have a final comment, and then I'll perhaps invite um, one of the Māori councillors to move and second their report. Yeah, it's just a procedural matter, and I'm sure we really, we've had no discussion during, during, during this particular debate about which option we, which we, which we, we intend choosing. And I think it's up to look for, for our councillors to propose which option they would like us to take forward. Uh, and, and indeed, I think we ought to have that discussion, or at least uh, have a, a, an option on the table before we move to the, the vote for the recommendations. I think that's already in, in the terms of reference. Um, so that's proposed that we bring it off today as a committee of the whole. I, I, so sorry, I just don't see it in the recommendations. Oh, it's not in the recommendation, it's in the appendix itself. Surely, Madam Chairman, it should be in the recommendations. We can certainly do that. I have a mover um, with a, uh, perhaps a suggested amendment. Um, yep. What I would suggest, as specified in Appendix 1, um, uh, confirming it will be a committee, committee now and will be a committee of the whole, and also uh, um, an addition regarding shared decision making with Maori. If everybody's happy with that, and we have a mover and a second, then I can put the motion. Be moved. Moved, Councillor McDonald. Yes. I'm happy to let someone else second, Madam Chair, but before I do that, 
the reality of um, a Committee of Whole being on the line. Um, it's incumbent upon us now to challenge our own people to lift the game and come to those meetings. Okay, yeah, that's really, really important. So I think that's the burden this man put on our shoulders just now. So um, I'll, I'll rest and I'll let someone else second the motion, Madam Chair. Uh, with a view to partnership, I, I'm, I'm happy to allow uh, one of the non Māori caucus members of, uh, of our forum to second that. Happy to second that, Madam Chair. Seconded, Councillor Thurston. Thank you very much. I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against, carried. Madam Chair, can we note that that was passed unanimously when it's recorded in the minute? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so now we move on to um, item 10.5, which is community participation and impact. And we have Karen Aspie to present, supported by Zaban Alec. Um, so that's on page 136 of your agenda. Well, um, councillors, um, so you have the paper before you. Um, so we're at the stage of our LTP process now where we um, normally provide you with some criteria upon which um, you guide us at this stage so that we can assess all of the applications that come in um, via our community um, and provide you with advice through deliberations upon which to make your decisions. Um, so that part of the paper is um, what you would normally be seeing at this stage. The addition um, in this paper this time is the conversation around impact and we provided you with some additional options in the paper today. Um, should you wish to focus um, the funding for community participation on some strategically important priorities that you've talked about? Um, so there are additional options in there, um, should you wish to do that. Um, I'll ask um, Siobhan to run through um, the criteria. Um, and yeah, and, for any, and then we'll come back for any questions. Thank you, Karen. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, as Karen has noted, um, we're now at the point of our RTP where we start considering external requests for funding. So um, traditionally, we assess these via the um, SIF criteria against the benefits they accrue to the Bay of Plenty as overall and their alignment with community outcomes. So this year around, we're basically making these a little bit more explicit and we're using a process of impact assessment, which it can be summed up as saying, if we fund this project, what will the benefit for the communities be and applying a bit more specificity about that. So to do that, we follow a multi-stage process. We identify whether it's in alignment with, with required legislation, uh, what the claimed benefits are and how likely it is that those claimed benefits will be achieved because we want to see evidence of a similar uh, intervention having similar benefits in the past. We then look at the overall cost of it and then we look at the project feasibility as well. Someone might have a really great proposal that is likely to achieve really good things and we know that what they're saying will work, but they themselves might not have any experience in the field. So overall, we assess the impact of a proposal in that way. And that, um, in general terms, would mean that we could generally assess any type of proposal against any other type of proposal and get a rough um, estimate of what the overall impact would be. Now, we would then present that to you as a series of evaluations. However, the responsibility for decision making always rests with councillors. And so we provide that to you in terms of whether something is a strong proposal or a weak proposal or, or such things. Um, but again, in a base level, it would be agnostic. However, as Karen has alluded to today, we are seeking your guidance on whether or not we weight some of the impact assessment criteria. Uh, Karen has noted that there are three areas of the strategic priorities, which are climate change, Māori partnership and community participation, where councillors have um, aspired to taking a position of regional leadership and potentially transformational change. So the three options that we are presenting to you in terms of our assessment are First, that we weigh the um, proposals that are aligned to those three areas higher than proposals in other areas. That does not foreclose that other proposals in other areas will not still rank higher. Option two is that we simply rate against impact. So more benefit in one area is equivalent to more benefit in another area. So we don't have any particular flavour across it. And then option three is that we only look at um, the impacts in those three areas of money partnership, 
climate change and community participation and therefore community initiative, community funding requests in other areas will have their impact assessed as zero. So um, I can sum it up by saying that options one and three, which are the more focused areas, would enable us to potentially uh, achieve greater impact in those three areas. The risk is, however, that uh, if we reduce the, the options available and we wait more in certain areas, there is the possibility of a reputational risk because that wasn't necessarily made public to um, applicants, so they may have put in applications that are not in those areas. Um, so really it comes down to uh, whether we want to sort of have a broader lens or whether we want to focus our um, effort and, and willingly sort of uh, acknowledge that we may not achieve greater impact in some other areas because they don't align with those three um, significant areas. Thank you. Um, uh, I have um, Councillor Thompson first up, then Councillor Von Darlison, Councillor Rose, and then Councillor Brunning and Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I can't um, and won't uh, support any change uh, at this stage. Uh, the application form and information makes it very clear to those who have applied uh, that the assessments will be made on the basis of how the work supports the council work and its outcome areas. Uh, and I have talked with a number of community organisations who have completed their applications and it is their understanding that that's the criteria. So to now bring in a different or new criteria, in my view, is unfair and I, don't believe, and I, I will not be uh, supporting a change at this stage. I accept going forward that we may want to look uh, at impact investing in a broader sense, and I think that that's a, a strategic and a policy matter uh, that we can have regard to. But at this particular stage, I will not be supporting option one or three on the basis of natural justice and fairness to those community organisations and groups who have acted in good faith on the basis of the information supplied. The applications are now closed, and I consider it unfair to change the rules uh, at this stage of the game. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Von What more can I say? I 100% support Councillor Thompson. 100%. I think to, to, to put criteria in once you've gone out for submissions uh, is, is, is not a fair process. It's, it's not showing good faith to our community. We, we, we've put this out, and I think it's, it's actually trying to lead us now. Uh, in our deliberations, and we, um, we, we're, we, we have to come to our deliberations with an open mind based on where, what, we, what we put out for submission. I totally agree with Councillor Thompson that in the future we can look at this. But this year we've, we have a process that is midway process, and I will not be one who uh, shows any pretext predetermination. So I um, would oppose this. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rose. Yeah, um, I 100% I agree with Councillor Thompson and Councillor Von Darlison. This would just be an unfair um, thing to do. I think um, if this sort of thing was to happen, it should have been brought to us at our last council meeting. Um, however, I'd also like to say that um, obviously the CIF funding um, and the um, EEF funding are two different forms. So we could potentially look at this later on in the year towards the EEF funding rather than um, putting it all into one. Um, the CIF funding, submissions have closed. It's unfair to do this. However, the EEF funding is something we could consider later on in the year. Thank you, Councillor Rose. Councillor Brunning. It's all being said, uh, Madam Chair, so I'll move the recommendation with option uh, uh, B, 4B, which is option 2. Second. Mover and seconder. Uh, Councillor Clark, did you want to? No, no, actually, um, I'm totally supportive of, particularly of, 
uh, gives the status quo. I mean, while one and three may give us focus on rationalising resources, I actually think they completely take the flexibility out of our system in a, in a moving feast. And uh, so the status quo or that option two being the uh, an adoption. Move the motion be put. Uh, we've just got one comment, Councillor Love. Then I think that. Thank you, Councillor. No, I just, I just fully agree with the the other comments from around the table. I, I think the staff and ourselves uh, are, are competent and experienced enough to be able to assess these recommend any submissions they make put to us in on their own right. Uh, we know what our objectives are. We know where we're going, uh, and I, all I can do is just fully support the speaker so far. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'll put the motion on that. Oh, 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 just, oh, oh, just a question. If we vote for 4B, do we need 6? So, um, through, through you, Chair, we'll still be assessing them. We won't be weighting those three areas any higher. So we still will conduct an assessment to, to assist your decision making. Whoever has noted, we will not be, you know, for ranking or anything like that. We're just giving you whether they're a strong or a weak or, a, or, you know, whether the evidence is strong, but we will not be, for example, taking a climate change proposal and, and assigning it a double value or anything like that. And I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against. Carried. Councillors, we have morning tea at 10.30. Um, if you have an appetite, we can deal with enhancing your engagement now before morning tea. Is everybody happy about that? Okay, I will now introduce item 10.4, Enhancing Youth Engagement, and we have now Muta, um, supported by Stephanie, McDonald, and also Troy. Welcome. Tēnā koutou, councillors, and we're on page 120 of your reports, and I'll hand over to Steph for our short presentation. Uh, tēnā koutou, council. Thank you very much for having us here this morning. Um, Young people care about the work that we do, even if they don't know what it is that we do. Uh, data that was received from the Pauranga City Council through a survey of almost 700 young people said that they prioritise protecting our environment, protecting our waterways, the better management of public transport. We're here to share with you today the recommendations what we've heard from young people themselves. This is in response to direction from Council late last year to enhance the way that we engage with, with young people. Um, before I carry on, I'd like to acknowledge our working party. We've had councillors knees eating rows who've been supporting our team. And I'd also like to acknowledge our new team member, Troy Brown, started with us in just November, and he's really driven this work for our team. So thank you, Troy. Um, the purpose of this paper is to seek your approval to progress a youth engagement plan based on our recent engagement and earlier work and research that we've done. But it's really about Tabe. Why are we doing this? To protect our tomorrow. Um, based on the youth, of, youth voice, the research, and working with our partners, we're recommending that we develop an engagement plan that explores, that explores targeted youth communication, an innovative problem-solving event approach, um, supported by a youth design group, and also exploring work experience opportunities for young people. This request would reallocate some of our existing budget, but also it is a request for an additional $45,000, which we would seek through long-term plan deliberations. Over the last two months, there has been an impressive amount of work to connect with young people from right across the region, uh, including Ben Neve, who was here today. He was part of one of our first workshops. But we've also worked with partner organisations and existing events to reach as wide an audience as we can. We would have liked to have reached more. We had planned events with the University of Waikato, Tui Okumai, and also the Youth Justice Unit in Rotorua, which had to be rescheduled or deferred due to COVID alerts. Uh, in total, we reached 135 participants in person, uh, plus we reached 198 online. Um, there is a minor correction to acknowledge, Madam Chair, through our paper. On page 127, there is a graph that outlines our reach in terms of ethnicity. Uh, in our haste to get some data into our paper, we've completed some data sets. Um, it's more like 59.7% of our face-to-face -face participants identified as Māori, which is still high, but not quite as high as we had first anticipated. In terms of our findings, we find that 
young people were unaware of our role. Almost 73% had not interacted with regional council before. Um, and more than half were unaware of what BOPRC stood for um, or what kind of work we did. And that meant that there were less, more than half were, were undecided about whether they wanted to engage or participate with regional council. So Troy worked through a number of workshops and then took those workshop su suggestions out to community online, but also through events and pop-up stalls and had 257 young people vote on the, pro, on the solutions that young people proposed. The most popular proposal was, was work experience and day trips, actually being able to see and experience what it is we do at Council, followed by visits to school and kura, social media, problem solving challenges, youth workshops, that's um, our teal one, and, um, and a youth design group. So that's fed into the, into the recommendations that we'd like to bring to you today. So our recommendations are on page 130. Firstly, we want to develop a youth engagement plan and we want to include youth voice in that. Uh, speaking with our colleagues at Waikato Regional Council and Canterbury Regional Council, um, they have youth design groups or ROPU groups. Uh, we're looking to learn from what they're doing and they have been fantastic at sharing their terms of reference and their practices. Um, we would like to work with our communications team to have what we've called translation tools, but communication tools and tactics that will work for youth. We'd like to offer opportunities for work experience that fit with our strategic priorities for councils so young people can see pathways into employment, but also build an understanding so they can hear about the work and then take action and be involved in decision making processes. <coughs> Uh, and lastly, we have an innovative youth problem-solving initiative, or a hackathon. Uh, some of you interested in climate change may have seen Wellington City Council's recent climate-thon event, where they partner with the University of Victoria to identify problem-solving solutions that have then been supported to be delivered. Um, if Council supports the proposals that we have outlined some suggested next steps on page 135, um, with your support, we'd like to make a start on them as soon as, as, soon as practical, uh, and we can make some start, a start on some of these actions before the end of the financial year, so that we could seek to establish a group early in the new financial year, so hopefully around July. Um, we would welcome any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a question from Councillor Luck and Councillor Rose. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as chairman of risk and assurance, um, I often bleat about the, the issues which we have about funding. Um, and indeed, I, I will make the point that, that we're going to face some very, very difficult decisions in the, in, in the months ahead uh, as we try and reconcile all we wish to do uh, with uh, the budget which we have, which we, I think, would be important, which I would not like to see blown out of the water. However, um, what I would say in this particular regard, uh, against all my better instincts on budgeting, I would like to support this particular move under $45,000. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From Councillor Rose, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Ron Davis, and Councillor Clark, and your Councillor E.T. Thank you. Now, um, Councillor Love, I know it's April Fool's Day, so don't pull us, <laughs> don't pull our legs. Um, <laughs> no, um, hey, look, I, I just, I just wanted to say that um, this this particular co copper having worked alongside Troy Namuta um, and my fellow working party, um, this has been a really good journey. Um, obviously, COVID and our dearest earthquakes out the other end of um, the East Coast have uh, disturbed a few of our uh, consultations, but actually, overall, we've done a good job. Um, yes, there have been a few areas that we could have done better. Um, however, I think um, for the time frame we've had, um, and Troy acknowledging you, um, coming fresh in in November and all of a sudden being thrown into this, well done. Um, I think it's a um, really good opportunity for our council to actually make um, the next steps 
uh, and hearing not only what young people have to say on certain issues, um, but also um, for young people to actually be able to move forward um, with us um, as a council. Um, I just wanted to ask, in regards to the design group, how do you guys plan on recruiting when it comes around to when it comes to the crunch? How do you plan on recruiting? Because the thing that um, I just have a bit of a concern about is ensuring that we have um, a diverse range of young people, whether it be intermediate or working on a construction site in the middle of the wop wops. Um, I think we just need to consider that and ensure that we have a diverse range. So do you guys have any current ideas about that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, we will look to develop a terms of reference on how we recruit. Um, we absolutely intend to pay meeting fees to recognise that there will be some people who are giving up paid employment or other opportunities to be there. Uh, as with other, other community groups, we'll look to provide funding towards travel and mileage as we would for other community groups. Um, we certainly want to reach a diverse audience, and I think we might have a, we'll certainly look at what Waikato Regional Council is doing. Troy's hoping to attend their Northern Marae for their first group in May um, to learn from their experiences, but also we'll talk with Tauranga City Council who have been really proactive with their youth advisory group to ensure that they have, they have a young parent in their group. They have someone who's a student, who's a tertiary student, you know, they're looking, they have someone who's an apprentice, I believe, you know, they're looking to get that full gamble. Um, the other element is that we, while we will look to hold face-to-face -face meetings, we recognise that that can be a significant challenge and we'll look to hold a mix of online and face-to-face. -face. We're working through that. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you. Well, firstly, congratulations to you, Councillor Rose. Um, I think we do recognise that, you know, you have come in with a huge passion uh, for ensuring that uh, younger people's voices uh, and choices are actually included in a democratically participated way. So congratulations to you, AB supported by Councillor Nees and Eti. But thank you to the staff. And Steph, I thought your opening remarks were outstanding. Troy, you've obviously done a, a superb job, so absolutely well done. Uh, I totally obviously support this. And I just draw everyone's attention to the principles of local government uh, that apply to us in all of our decision making. And we are required at law, section 14, to always in all of our decisions have regard to the interests of future communities and generations and the impact of our decisions on in fact, those future generations and communities. So congratulations uh, to all involved. I think it's absolutely marvellous. Well done, Stacey. Thank you. See Councillor uh, Thompson. Uh, Councillor uh, Von Dutterson. I have no trouble supporting this, but I do give a, a word of caution with regard to the Enviro Schools program. I find a, a little bit concerned that, that we are walking away from this after uh, such a long period with it. The, the, the first um, um, the, fir the first introduction to uh, education and the environment uh, is a critical one for, for getting a young mind thinking. A and I would, I, I hesitate to think that we should be switching one out for the other. A and I just wonder if there's some compromise there um, that we can manage this because because I'm still a, a believer in the Enviro School and I. I I just, I think you're throwing the baby out a little bit with the bathwater, but can I just give a word of caution? Thank you. If I may, if I may, Madam Chair, the, the question around virus schools is something that our team has, has I, I think it's weighed heavily on us. It's something that I've been involved with personally for the last, the last 10 years with Regional Council. Um, I think when the program first started, there was an absence of support for environmental education and it certainly filled a gap in terms of being a holistic program that supported environmental education across the curriculum. Um, as times have changed, while we are on paper have 80 schools, kura or early learning centres registered in virus schools, less than half themselves would say that describe themselves as active. Um, we see that the fit now is 
doesn't is more limited in terms of our community outcomes. It is fit, the fit is much closer with our um, territorial authority, the city and district councils. Um, and much of the work that fits within Enviro schools, absolutely it's about sustainability, but it often sits beyond the scope of what is a regional council responsibility. It takes a very non-prescriptive approach. It's about exploring and discovering and setting your own goals, which is fantastic from an educational purpose, but not necessarily in terms of being able to measure our engagement and our impact um, for the community outcomes we're working towards. So it's with a bit of a heavy heart that we put forward this recommendation, but the question now is really, is it the role of regional council to be supporting this program? And we feel that we can get more meaningful outcomes for our community and for our council by taking a more modern approach. Thank you. I uh, have Councillor Clark, Councillor Eke, Councillor Crosby, Councillor Rose and Councillor McDonald, and then we have shortly, we're going to be running out of morning tea time, so, um, <laughs> Councillor uh, briefly, um, on the state of the, the quantum of your budget, it seems to me to be far too light considering what your ambitions are in this space. I mean, 74 grand to run this program, I think it's absurd. I mean, if I had the opportunity, I would make a recommendation at least lift that to 100,000 when you consider the, the enormous amount we're actually putting the Māori consultation space um, and this the Ranga Tahi, which is the real Thank you, Councillor Clark. We can't have any predetermination. Maybe staff would like to come back to us in the long-term plan papers. Sorry about that. Um, Councillor Crosby. Oh, sorry, Councillor Eddie. Uh, Kia ora, Madam Chair. I'll be uh, certainly supporting this recommendation and I uh, would like to echo the sentiments of uh, Councillor Thompson uh, and congratulating uh, firstly Councillor Rose uh, and being the champion uh, at this table for this very important kaupapa, uh, as well as to staff, Steve Namuta and Nomai no here, Troy, um, that uh, this is great. I mean, we're talking about uh, our next generation of ratepayers. If we want them to be uh, talking more about levels of service and the things that we actually do, rather than just trying to keep rates down, this is the kind of work that we uh, need to be investing in. So kia ora. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crosby. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and well done today. And if I could just share some of my personal experience in a previous life uh, in an attempt. Uh, in this field, um, they failed miserably, actually. Uh, and they failed because, and this is hopefully a system of design moving forward, because they failed because they had a focus on a few individuals, and I'm talking about a youth council here, who were, in fact, amazing young people, but they were the high performers bordering on the elite, and they didn't actually represent youth in a, in a broader context. So I'd encourage you to look at the whole cohort of youth in your design, that's absolutely critical. Those that don't necessarily put their hands up, hands up or, or come forward on that. Uh, the other major failing was it was grossly underfunded. In fact, we funded it to fail. Um, twice in, in our attempts down the road. So again, at a point in time, you know, appropriate resourcing to make a difference is critical. And the last thing I'll say in your design, would you please consider a civics component of it? Um, and other so that the youth can understand their actual role and participation in civics. It's, it's a, just a huge worry in this country that it's something that we don't do well and yet it's a critical part of the whole democratic process, you know, as they move forward. Thank you, Councillor Crosby. Councillor Rose, did you have another one for um, me? Yeah, um, one I wanted to move for motion. Um, and two, um, I did want to just add that um, in light of the work we have done, um, I do hope that staff um, take on board um, in particular what Councillor Crosby has just said. Um, it is essential that we ensure that all rangatahi have the opportunity to have a voice. It may not be all of them, they may choose not to, but ensuring all rangatahi, no matter where they're from or what background they come from, have an opportunity to have a voice in this kaupapa. So just keep that in mind as you guys head forward in the design process. Councillor Rose, uh, sorry, Councillor uh, McDonald and then Councillor White. 
thank you. I had my question answered, but I just want to um, reiterate really the concerns. I had similar concerns as Councillor from Adelson, and that was the um, around and virus falls, uh, but that was answered by uh, by staff. Um, so I will be supporting the recommendation based on what you have. Um, you, Madam Chair, just very quickly, I'm, I'm very supportive and, and um, happy to second the motion just put by, by, by Councillor Rose. But in saying that, just also want to really congratulate Councillor Rose again. I don't think, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's put in a terrific effort around this table to, as you say, uh, Councillor Thompson to manifest the position of Omotahi. So thank you, Councillor Rose, and to you. Just a question, a very quick question. I noticed on one of your slides that Luatoki had about six times, seven times the number of attendees at the week. I'd like to know what the formula is, and we could use that for our engagement of the year. Uh, through Madam Chair, um, the process that was taken was a number of workshops, a number of community events, but to seek a large audience in Luatoki, it was in partnership with the, the Whare Kura there. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we have a mover and a seconder, and I would just like to add my sincere congratulations and thanks to staff. Um, my children and my children's children are the drivers for me being around this table today because they will inherit um, our earth. So, um, with that, I'd like to put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. So now we'll have a break for morning tea. I'm sorry you've left just a quarter of an hour, and I'll see you back here at 11. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Yes. Right, councillors, thank you. Um, I would, at this time, I would like to welcome Sir Rob McLeod and Warren Parker, who are Keyside Directors. Um, hello, gentlemen. Nice to have you with us today. And also Scott McLeod, the Chief Executive of Keyside Holdings, uh, for our next item, which is... I've got the all black now. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I have a, I have a son in law whose um, brother has got the cloud, so we must have a problem. Sorry about that. Um, so, we're dealing today with the Keyside Holding Statement of Intent and Harkey Report. I just want to note for councillors that some of these um, statement of intents, draft statement of intents, are in open, as is the annual report, but um, the letter from Keyside um, and um, the presentation will be in public excluded. So um, I'll ask Scott just to uh, introduce these items and then I will invite councillors to make any comments or questions that they can on the items in public, uh, in the public uh, part of the agenda for more substantive discussion and questioning, I will move into um, public excluded. So over to you, Scott. <coughs> Okay, thank you. So, um, good morning. Unfortunately, I don't have the council papers in front of me, but uh, I understand that there are two papers that have been prepared by uh, Mark and the team in terms of outlining the draft statement of intent, which has been submitted to council as at the 1st of March. <coughs> thank you. Um, and also the draft statement of intent for the Tuan Moana Trust. Um, we will pass some comment, I guess, on the logistics of how we will achieve some of those things through the through the process of the presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions on those um, draft SOIs at this time. Any comments or questions? Otherwise, we will move into oh, one from Kevin. I'm um, sorry, Councillor. So just in the executive summary, yep. it's not a misprint. Keysight Equity Portfolio did a, delivered a return of 18% for six months. Uh, yes, we did have a stunning six months. Um, yeah, and actually say, global markets. No, global markets, and we'll cover this a little bit more on the broader presentation, but global markets had a really um, unusual response to to COVID. Um, and uh, we're obviously a benefactor of that by being invested in part of those. So we'll cover a little bit more soon. Very good. Thank you. Well, I don't see any further comments or questions, so I will move that we um, move into the public excluded. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. We'll see that. I'll put that in. So, Councillors, we are now on to uh, paper 10.8, uh, the Treasurer 
report on LGFA borrowing maturing in April 2021. Oh, I beg your pardon. 10.7. Sorry. Our LGFA draft statement of intent. So um, that's welcome to Andrew. Is it me? me, me Michael? Michael? Michael. Yeah. Michael. Oh, thank you. Um, welcome, Andrew. And uh, Debbie and uh, Mark are going to be talking to us on behalf of the, um, this paper. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, today we have the draft statement of the 10th and half year report for LGFA, and it's our pleasure to have the Manager of External Relations for LGFA here to present with some detail. Uh, through this process, we've had our General Manager Corporate involved as part of the Shareholder Council to make sure the process follows what councils require, and we're confident we're in a strong position with LGFA. I'll hand over to Andrew Meekle to talk through these documents. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm only going to talk to sort of a couple of slides and hopefully leave uh, sufficient time for you to sort of ask uh, questions. Um, Uh, firstly, just on page three, recent developments. Um, in the last couple of weeks, one development was LGFA's credit rating was upgraded by Standard & Poor's from AA plus to AAA. Um, that was as a result of the New Zealand Sovereign rating also being upgraded to AAA. Um, that's all good news for council councils in New Zealand in terms of their financing costs because it now means that LGFA is three credit notches higher than the best uh, bank in New Zealand, which is AA minus. So it gives us an advantage versus the banks and what we're able to raise money at um, in the wholesale market and therefore pass on those uh, benefits to uh, councils. Um, Last, well, this current year is going to see a record amount of uh, council borrowing, so it's likely to be close to $3 billion by the time uh, this financial year uh, ends. Uh, part of that is refinancing of existing debt, but there's also a lot of new borrowing sort of going on. Um, in recent years, it's really been Auckland and to some extent Christchurch that have led the increase in sector borrowing, but we're certainly seeing um, it is now more widespread across the whole sector. So there's real um, change in terms of a willingness to get on and do uh, uh, investment in infrastructure. Uh, membership of LGFA, so Napier joined last week, so we're now up to 72 out of the 78 councils in New Zealand. And we have Dunedin and Southland that are about to join uh, this year. Both have done their consultation. So we're only left with a few councils that uh, won't be sort of members, including the Chatham Islands. And so most of those councils, uh, that, well, the few councils that are not members uh, don't have any council debt, uh, don't have any debt, so therefore um, they may join in the future if that, uh, that sort of changes. Uh, so it's certainly been a successful business in terms of support across the whole sector uh, for the uh, concept. Uh, in terms of new product initiatives, um, what we've done uh, recently is introduce uh, standby facilities, committed standby facilities to councils. So we signed our first deal with Auckland um, about a month ago. So we're not uh, telling councils to replace their committed bank facilities, but it means LGFA is now in the market at a cheaper price than, than banks for committed facilities. So at a minimum, at least, we're there providing a competitive tension uh, to enable councils to negotiate uh, a better deal. In the next 12 months, we're proposing to do green and sustainable lending to councils. So that is part of a global trend to see more of uh, green and sustainable lending uh, take place. So we have already developed the framework and we'll roll that out. So when you borrow, if you have the right projects, you can borrow on a green or sustainable basis. 
And thirdly, uh, direct lending to CCOs, so shareholders approved that change uh, middle of last year. So we're now in a position to lend directly to CCOs. Uh, however, there's probably got to be some scale to that. So unless there's over 50 million worth of debt, there's probably not worth councils putting in place that, or the CCO putting in place that uh, legal arrangement. Um, the SOI. Could I ask Madam Chair, would you mind? Could I just, of course. At, at, at a general strategic level, um, is the organisation actively involved with the Three Waters Reform Program? Uh, yes, that's probably the single biggest issue on our minds at the moment. Uh, DIA have been good in terms of keeping us updated in terms of where things are going, although you know things are continuing to change as they collect more information. Um, our CEO met with the Minister uh, two weeks ago and sort of had a discussion uh, with her. Um, exactly what LGFA's role is, we're not 100% sure, so it could be LGFA, well, the two options are probably LGFA only finance councils going forward. Um, so that would see, while well, council lending is going up, it would see an initial drop as we transfer four or five billion dollars of debt to the water uh, uh, entities, or LGFA could play a wider role in fund councils and the water entities. So that is something that would need to be discussed both with the government and uh, shareholders. Um, the issue is without some sort of form of government support for the water entities, the revenue stream that water entities get is going to be a lower credit quality than what councils get because it won't be secured by rates. It will just be a water charge. Um, therefore, you know, we would want to ensure that yeah, LGFA's credit rating is, remains at the same of the government, so that is something that we have to work through. Just uh, forgive me for uh, the grandmother and sucking eggs, but um, to me, this is probably the biggest issue your organisation is facing. Uh, and the scale, well, Councillor Cosby, who's you know all over it, um, but this is coming at such pace um, that I just believe that this is a very urgent issue for the shareholder uh, to actually consider. Thank you. That's correct. So the LGFA Shareholders Council will have to have discussions uh, on that, and Bay Plenty Regional Council is one of the largest shareholders, along with the government's 20% stake. Um, the LGFA board had a strategy meeting a couple of weeks ago, and that was probably the topic that took up the most debate. I mean, the overriding principle is LGFA is sustainable, whether it just funds councils or it funds a, a wider range of, of entities, including the water entities. So the view is, you know, it's about doing the best thing for New Zealand um, because LGFA could sort of be either. So we just want to support whatever the best initiatives are, along with representing what the shareholder views uh, and the direction the shareholders give. Um, the draft uh, statement of intent, uh, we have primary objectives as well as secondary objectives. The objectives uh, remain unchanged with the exception of the last of the secondary objectives, which is we've added that in to assess, assist the local government sector with significant matters and that at the moment is the three water. Last year it was the COVID issues, um, but this year it's going to be the three water sort of program. So we've added that in because, uh, as has been raised, that is the single most uh, important issue that is uh, facing the sector, um, and especially territorial sort of uh, uh, councils. Um, Uh, these are the performance targets to the 6th of, uh, to the uh, 30th of December, just to see how uh, we've been sort of tracking. Um, so the two that we didn't meet, the first one is to achieve uh, 
85% sort of market share. It came in slightly under that. The issue LGFA has is we only finance around a third of Auckland's debt and they finance two thirds in their own name. That is, we, LGFA cannot finance all of Auckland's debt because otherwise we'd be too concentrated to Auckland. So that is something that the rating agencies would have concerns uh, about. Um, so when Auckland do issuance in their own name, we go through periods where we don't meet um, our market share. But as the note down the bottom sort of alludes to, um, if we excluded Auckland, then we were financing 94% of the rest of the sector. So we do have an incredibly high market share. The other one is we, our objective is to get out and meet with each of our member councils at least sort of once a year. Due to the disruption of COVID and lockdown, that is something that we couldn't do uh, last year. Um, but we're back on track to, to meet with all uh, councils before 30th of June this year. So we expect to meet that, uh, that objective. Um, I'll just touch briefly on the, on the profit. Uh, just that top uh, right hand box. Uh, you can see LGFA's profits been tracking at around $10, $11 million each financial year. Um, and you can see our forecasts sort of going forward. Um, I just sort of highlight that LGFA is quite different than other entities such as sort of banks because we're not trying to maximise our profit. So to the extent that we become more profitable, what we tend to do is reduce borrowing costs to, to member councils and pass some of those uh, savings that we're able to make back to the sector. We do want to achieve a certain level of profit um, because we want to retain equity in the business, which is that bottom left-hand graph. So you can see there our shareholder equity is uh, continuing to increase, and that's because our total assets, which is driven by lending to the sector, is continuing to increase. So we just want to ensure that our shareholder equity as a percentage of total assets remains relatively constant. Uh, so that acts to protect the, the council sort of guarantors. Um, I'll finish there and happy to take questions. So Thompson. Yeah, thank you. Question to you, uh, Mark. Um, the guarantee, that's obviously in our accounts as a liability, is it? So our guarantee is mentioned as a disclosure in our financials. It's not accounted for at base value as a liability. You need to take into account the likelihood of that uh, liability being executed. So it's currently recognised in wording, but not as a figure that is added to our total liability balance. Follow up, if I may, Madam Chair, given the three waters, um, do you believe that that should be revisited? Uh, my understanding of the Three Waters program at the moment is that if the borrowing is transferred across from councils to uh, potential Three Waters agencies, there would be some consideration back to the council, which would have, which. Yeah. So, so leaving a whole bunch of uh, deep stranded with no assets would be um, an unusual situation. Uh, we will continue to watch the legislation. I don't think it's worth changing at the moment. But as we progress to a firm bill, it'll be uh, quite a watch that, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So just LGFA can only lend to a council or a council-controlled organisation where the council guarantees that CCA. So we would not be in a position to lend to a water entity unless shareholders gave us approval to, to do so. And they haven't done so today. So we wouldn't be able to lend to the water entities as it stands at the moment. Thank you for a very clear presentation. Um, I, I really appreciate that final clarification. It sort of it, um, appeases my concerns. Um, are there any other questions or comments? If not, do I have a move up of our recommendations, which are on yeah. page 177? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Councillor Love and Councillor Ron Douglas in second. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I've got that motion. All those in favour, aye. aye. Against, carried. 
Uh, councillors, we've got two choices. We, we've got two um, more papers. Um, the first is the um, block based draft SOI, and the second is the Treasury report on LTFA borrowing, and then we've got some minutes. So, do you want to push on? Push, push on, on, push on. on. There we go. All right, excellent. So, um, I think what we'll do is we'll go back to item 10.6 which is the Botless Draft Statement of Intent on page 145, and I see that Matt is in the chair, is that right, or is it Mark? Right, thank you, go away, Mark. I mean, <laughs> take it away, Mark. <laughs> so, first of all, apologies from Botless who are unable today to come along to present their draft SOI and half year report. Um, in summary, um, we would like Botless to continue in many areas. We'd love to see more um, benefit through joint procurement approaches. However, Botless always works through a process where all our other councils need to be willing participants. Um, through Fiona as our, as our director on Botless, as well as the other chairs, we're always looking for opportunities in this space. Um, given that it needs to be willing, willing participant from other councils, we don't see much point in providing formal response to Bot Place at this stage. However, happy to take your direction. Councillor Winters. Um, if we're wanting to see other forms of procurement, Mark, or through Fiona, um, which other TLAs are supportive of us, or are they all opposed to us? So through you, Tia, um, Bot Place does a very good job in terms of what it does. Yeah, uh, and and there are lists in terms of page 162 and 163 of your agenda in terms of potential other procurement. It's worked very well for us in terms of insurance and health and safety and LIDAR. So it's very good at what it does uh, and it's really chasing opportunities for joint procurement. As Mark has said, uh, sometimes you know it is the coalition of the willing in terms of who's involved there, but it certainly has provided benefit to the regional council uh, and, and the areas that it works in. Thank you for the question. Comfort? Oh, Madam Chair, I just yeah. note the... Sorry, Councillor, just... So is it just us? Is it just the Regional Council that's pushing for other pure procurement initiatives? Or, are the, or is it just the TLAs, all the TLAs pushing back? So through you, uh, Chair, there are a number of um, uh, opportunities that are listed on page 160 to 163 of your agenda in terms of all other procurement opportunities. You recall that this council in the past has sought for BOPLAS to do more than joint procurement, uh, but uh, the other councils were not of that same ilk. And it does a very good job in terms of what it does. Yeah, Madam Chair, and I acknowledge that, Fiona, and I think we've had the debate and discussion around. Um, I just noticed the insurance, uh, the what's coming up on the insurance um, market. I think we're in for some hefty increases and difficulties in that space. But, you know, no, congratulations and, and thank you. Excellent. Uh, any further comments or we'll move it and see you um, Councillor Love, move. Um, Councillor Crosby, second. Just, just a second, that I'm not sure if, as a director, that you're engaged with the Waikato Lass, who I know are moving into um, a higher level of joint service agreements and uh, and delivery. Yeah. I used to be watching that with interest in terms of how they're um, moving forward. Thank you. Well, I'm going to put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. So, last substantive report is the Treasury report on LGFA borrowing and maturing in April 2021, page 227. And we have Debbie and Mark. Thank you. Um, just by way of a short introduction, um, Andy Dixon is an apology today. Um, he's actually actively engaged on our rates um, transition project, and we had Mark. Uh, LeComp, our Principal Advisor for Finance, uh, managing our Treasury portfolio um, with my and Matt's help. So I'll hand it over to Mark um, to introduce our report. Thank you. 
Um, as always with our major financial transactions, we seek uh, independent uh, treasury advice from Bancorp on the best course of action. As you know, over the past several years, we have pre-funded capital in advance of expenditure, and that has also enabled us to make a uh, financial gain as we could invest that in turn deposits at a higher rate. As has been signaled to you through the financial framework review, um, that situation is no longer continuing and we intend to pay our capital expenditure through our accumulated reserves in this long-term plan. Uh, with the borrowing maturing on the 15th of April, we've been through in some detail uh, on our cash flow forecasts and the use of funds and we believe the best way forward is to repay $50 million of borrowing uh, from our reserves. The majority of that money is from insurance recoveries. When we funded the flood repairs, we did that in advance of insurance. Now that insurance revenue has been received. So that's where the money has flowed through from in majority. Um, so we'd like to pay off that 50 million, which exceeds the chief executive's daily um, financial transaction limit. In addition, on the same day, we have $25 million of borrowing on the key side. Normally we've been rolling that at two year terms. They have requested it at a six month term, which meets all of our financial covenants. We have checked through, um, as, some, as this repayment of 50 million is not budgeted in the, the annual plan, we've checked through with audit and they are completely comfortable with our approach. Uh, so we are confident that we're doing the right thing here and are meeting all our legislative requirements. Thank you. Um, I have a, um, an amendment to recommendation five, um, and I'll read that out to you, unless you can put it on the screen. Through you, Madam Chair, should we talk to recommendation five that first? Okay, yes. great. Um, so for the previous years, uh, previous few years, we've been running a, a situation where we're heavy on cash and term deposits and heavy on borrowing. So um, with the repayment, we're being quite aggressive with it, which makes our cash flow quite tight. Um, I've gone through the forecast in terms of our revenue received and our expenditure, and while I believe we can afford this 50 million, as a matter of prudence, I would hate for a missed rates invoice or missed NZK revenue or something like that that has a time issue to, to uh, trip up our ability to pay our invoices on time. So therefore, purely as a risk mitigation, I'd like to have the ability uh, to take on short-term borrowing in the event that our forecast cash flows don't transfer, don't transfer exactly as planned. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I, I might have missed it. But what reserves are we using? Um, so through you, Chair, the repayment of the $50 million is largely the funds that we've received from insurance, around $30 million, and it's also the asset replacement reserve. Um, we rate, we um, recover our internal loans, um, put it into our asset replacement fund, and that is our reserve fund, which we use to either lower our external gross debt or we use it to pay for capital expenditure. So it is the asset replacement reserve that we're using predominantly to pay down the uh, gross borrowings with the LG Bay. So two funds. Um, sorry, I had understood that the repayments from what's effectively the PPS borrowing was going back into the regional infrastructure fund. So the oh. asset replacement reserve through you, Madam Chair, um, is the new loans that we've accumulated from our ratepayers from 1 July 2018. The old loans in relation to the PPS repayment continues to go through to the regional fund in this long-term plan. And we're not touching it. <laughs> and all expenditure from the regional fund reserve is only with council approval, uh, typically through the annual plan or in year monitoring. Thank you. And my yeah. last question that you'll all be delighted to know for the day is what are the risks associated with the utilisation of that asset uh, replacement reserve? Uh, we see this transaction as quite uh, business as usual. Um, we've taken out gross debt for capital expenditure of $181 million. We've received from insurance recoveries in our community $50 million in relation to that expenditure, and we're using that to repay the gross debt. So we, we see there's a gap, though, between 
Um, so the, the risk is around our liquidity management. So we've done a fantastic job of looking ahead for the next three years, um, but we know there's some uncertainties. So typically most councils have available to them an overdraft for, for ease, um, which they dip, dip, dip into and dip out when they have short-term cash flow requirements. Mark's presented a recommendation as four to um, give us approval to explore a, either a short-term facility with the LGFA or short-term loans. And I'd imagine we'll do the work up as part of our deliberations work for May and come back with something for you to consider. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I was going to note that you're going to be doing work on our treasury strategy as well, but the um, our LGP, um, but I presume that our financial is going to look quite different as well. Yes, we are going to have to remodel our balance sheet and our balance sheet levers. And I also just wanted to remind you we've got an informal briefing on the 21st of April, so it's only a couple of weeks away where we'll be presenting the updated um, full financial picture. What is? Oh, just amend that new amendment to number five. Can we just? Uh, at the end of it, set out in section three of the report and report as required and uh, inform councillors. If it's going to, if, if it happens. Thank you. Suggestion. Are you happy to move? Yeah. Councillor Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, yeah. Any other further comments? If not, thank you very much, staff. I'm going to put that motion all those in favour. Aye. 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 Against Harry. Home straight. Um, we are now uh, needing to move back into public exclusion. I'll move to the second. Thank you, Councillor Thompson.